Welcome to Classical Etc., a show that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. So thank you for joining us for another episode of Classical Etc. It's Friday in Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, the weekend of the Derby. Oaks Day. So it's a, it's a huge weekend for mm-hmm. people here. In today's conversation, we're going to be touching back to a topic that we've talked about before, about the relationship between classical literature and the classical cultures and Christianity. And we're going to follow up because it's just such a huge topic. There's more to say about how these two things relate to each other, two things that are at the core of our identity. But before we get there, we're going to probably get there in about five to six minutes. But before we get there, I just wanted to ask you guys, since last time we've met, what have you been reading? Martin, you finished Balzac, right? I did, Cousin Bet. And it's French. Uh, and and so there's a lot of sin in the novel. But I, I, I would... I was, I was trying to think, does this constitute a Christian novel? And I think it does. And I never really thought of Balzac that way. But, but uh, the character of Evangeline is a, she's a saint, really. And it, it's compelling, you know. Um, but I just finished uh, A Movable Feast by, mm, by right. uh, Ernest Hemingway. I had heard about it for many years. Um, but just this uh, uh, a chatty book about, these author, these famous authors that we've all heard about, who he's hanging around with in Paris, and and I mean, I didn't know that uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald was was such a hypochondriac uh, and was so tiresome for his friends. You know, I knew about his drinking, you know, and his uh, marriage and all that. But um, uh, Ford Maddox, Ford, um, uh, James Joyce. There's all these authors that he's talking about in there, and I'm thinking he must have written this long after they were dead because it's a tell-all book in a way. But it's fun because there's all these authors that you you know, but yet you don't yeah. really know, and it, it's uh, it's a fun book. In that crew of 21st century authors, I mean, is that your favorite in that that group, or, or is there one of those authors that their novel you like the most of the, like, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, Joyce, Hardy? Well, of course, I love Gatsby, uh, and and Hemingway thought that was a great novel. Now, Tanya, what do you think about Gatsby? <laughs> <laughs> I know what she thinks of Gatsby. It's one of the reasons I brought it up just to see what she would. I uh, you say. saw there was no response at all. <laughs> uh, I don't like any of those authors. You know, I'm not sure. Who... They're very male. Not oh, the adjective I was expecting. Yeah. They, I just feel like they're. I should have said Victoria Wolf as well. Well, I'm not Virginia, Virginia Woolf. Virginia yeah. Woolf so. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I tried just, reading Virginia Woolf, and I think she's trying to be Proust and not doing a very good job mm-hmm. of it. You know, this this sort of um, it's kind of Proust that ranges around. It's it's very stream of consciousness, and I, I I'm just not that convinced that Woolf is as good a writer as she's supposed to be. I was reading Joseph Epstein, uh, an essay by Joseph Epstein, the great. English essayist, American essayist. And he said he thought that Willa Cather's My Antonia was the greatest novel of the, of the 20th century. Wow, really? And I, I thought, that's interesting, because mm-hmm. I, just, I just read that. I may have said that on a previous show. That was the third, third book back I finished, and it was a wonderful novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that, that kind of surprised me that of all the authors we have, mm-hmm. it, was, it was Willa Cather. Tell me, what have you been what reading? Would it be? Fantasy. Good. My favorite genre. <laughs> I've been, needed. So I've got to start the um, second Lord of the Rings book. I did finish the first. I actually completed it. What do you think? Give I'm us your not, review. You know, his prose is just beautiful. It is such a beautiful book. Like to, It's just a book where every sentence you think that should be read out loud <laughs> because it is beautiful. But I'm still not a fan of orcs and dwarfs. And elves. I don't think you're supposed to be a fan of dwar- of orcs, at least. But I'm reading Prince Caspian. Or dorks, the mix between or, the four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm reading Prince Caspian again for Lee. Um, and I'm liking it better than I like The Lion, the Witch, and The Magician's Nephew. Thank goodness. I mean, it's fu- it's full of humor. And I think I do better with talking animals than I do with, <laughs> with dwarves. With yeah, made up. With made up. That creatures, hmm. but but I think That's those creatures are supposed to be certain aspects of of human beings. Well, sure, that are kind of being isolated. But I think that's the kind of thing I would have read to my children. Yeah. Whereas talking talking animals 
that, that, that like did, Brian Jake. Did you like his? Did you Brian read Jacques, his book? Yeah. Jacques. Jacques? No, no. Mice within sword fights. I just didn't do anything for me. Wow. Oh. A very, very polarized there. I wrote. <laughs> the, the, I read those to my well, children. And the only ones that are convincing are um, are. Um, let's. <laughs> Frank and the other book uh, with Mo- Mole and and oh, Wind in the Willows. Oh, Wind thinking. in the Willows. Yeah, Wind in the Willows. I think is convincing. More talking animals. That's yeah, right. and 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 also, I think Kipling is convincing in terms of talking animals because there's something he gets, and you, you're thinking if mm. that animal could talk, that particular kind of animal could talk, that's the way it would be. And I think Kip- Kipling gets that. Right. Now help me out here because I wasn't born in the 19th century. What did Kipling write with animals? Jungle yeah. Book. Jungle Book. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, his most famous books? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you mean the Disney movie? John, are you implying that Martin was born in the 19th century? <laughs> I, I, that, I took it that I way. doesn't logically follow. I took it, it that way. I follow. accept it and I'm proud. I wondered yeah. that myself. <laughs> so basically, I am not reading my favorite type of book. I really, Oliver Twist is on my bedside table because we're going to publish our own version. Right. And I really want to read it, and Lee just won't let me. Mm. She, just, <laughs> she just, I have to put that aside and read fantasy for her for a little while because she said it's important that we all have the same reading experience, that we're reading the same things and the same culture. So I'm doing it. Wow. It's, it's impressive. You're putting others before yourself. It's a character building experience. <laughs> You're so brave. I am yeah, brave. So brave. I am brave. John, but what are you reading? I don't know if I'm going to read that third one because that you know that third movie with all those it, the whole thing was that orc battle. You know, I, okay. When we third, get hate mail, we all know why it came because she's <laughs> well, down. and yeah. Tanya, the book that diverges the farthest from the well, Two Towers is like the the timelines are a bit different, but it's all the same content. There's a significant portion of. Return of the King that is not in the film. Oh, okay. So it may, it's worth, so it may be, it's not like one whole giant war with the orcs. Mm-hmm, right. right. And wouldn't okay. she have been better off if she had not watched the movie and read the book first? I, I watched know, the movie because I had to go movies. with you to chaperone your class. Okay. I, I went on. as a parent. <laughs> <laughs> you had to bring a class to Lord of the Rings? He did. Oh, he did. First came joyous out. day. But, wow. that, but his rule was that they had <laughs> to have read the books before uh, they could go. Oh, yeah. Mm. And she didn't. I didn't, but he needed me to drive children. <laughs> <laughs> John, what are you, what are you reading? Uh, I've just finished a book, uh, We the Drowned by Karsten Jensen, 21st century novel. Um, massive, beautiful, terrifying, distressing. It's a basically a novel that looks through the eyes of the entire population of Marstel, Denmark, uh, from the approximately 1800 to the end of World War II following these families generation by generation as essentially this one town of Danish sailors almost defines the maritime history f- throughout that entire period. Um, it's, I, I, I strongly recommend it with, you know, like viewer discretion, of course. Um, it's, you know, it's a tough read. It's a very sad read, a very gloomy read, but that's Scandinavian literature. So tell me how you came across this Scandinavian maritime <laughs> I am Scandinavian. Okay. Uh, I am Scandinavian. I'm not really maritime, but I keep my eyes out for okay. all things all things Viking and uh, uh, related. Um, so, have you read Patrick O'Brien? I've not. No. All or rather, those... I've I've read some of it, but mm-hmm. whereas, and I know I'm going to offend some viewers out here. Whereas, I love the movie adapted from it, Master and Commander. Mm. Um, the first novel Screaming. that I tried reading was. A little bit, a little bit not to my taste. However, I not same here. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, not to my taste applies to like 16-year-old John Christensen. So I have no idea whether I'd like it now, but didn't didn't work for me back then. If if you want good sea tales, C.S. Forrester's okay. uh, <coughs> Horatio Hornblower, right. the yeah. Good Shepherd, mm-hmm. The African Queen is sort of a uh, okay. I have begun a new book, which I think dovetails well into what we're about to talk about. I've begun reading the uh, poetry of William Blake. Do you know Mm. who that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically 18th century or 19th century, rather crazy person. Did he just Um, ask us if we know who Blake is? I think he did. Personally, you know, from from experience. (laughs) Uh, No, but 19th century crazy person, famous for his kind of lavish and bizarre um, woodcut illustrations, as well as his sort of bizarre, morally bent poetry. Where he just talks about the infernal mills. Did you know and that Blake like draws that. also? <laughs> yes, I knew that. He paints too. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I've got two Blake <laughs> drawings in my bedroom frame. Really? No yes, kidding. I do. Wow. 
John, I think they're making fun of you, but keep making your point. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, and I like the dark satanic mills. It's one of my favorite lines. It's the, a good kind of combination of words, a good mouthfeel when you say it. Um, but the, <laughs> the, I mean, the reason I'm reading it is precisely because I disagree with him, right? He's a, theologically a nutcase, but mm -hmm. he's trying to articulate an extremely well thought out, essentially personal cosmos that blends classical mythology and Christian, you know, Christian theology and his own weird visions that he's been having since he was three. And, you know, it, that kind of exposure to like this weird carbuncle on the side of classical literature is, I think, is valuable to sort of see the negative space where say, okay, well, you know, this is classical literature. This is the thing I love. Here's the part of it that makes no sense. And I can refute using the tree on which it's kind of, what's the adjective? Uh, clung. <laughs> Clung. I recently came across Blake a little bit in what I've been reading recently, which is I I, I did my annual rereading of uh, Milton uh, Milton's Paradise Lost over yeah. the last couple of I was going to ask you if you've been reading or just watching sports on TV. <laughs> well, I do watch a fair <laughs> amount of sports on TV because the Milwaukee Bucks are in the playoffs. But in the Paradise Lost, in the preface of the edition that I was what reading. What sport would this be? Uh, basketball. Hmm. Paradise Lost is basketball. But, but Paradise Lost is not basketball, but in the preface. Chris Colley, I need a basketball book now, please. <laughs> <laughs> they were discussing you know, this view of Satan conversation that surrounds reading of Paradise Lost. And it was Blake who said, it's not that Milton wrote Satan to be the hero. It's that he's such a great poet. He makes Satan appear appealing. And that was kind of mm -hmm. Blake's line. And it was later like Shelley who came along and said, no, he wrote God to be the villain and Satan to be the hero. But and that's right. to be debated. And we won a great essay on, on William Blake. Um, there's a book called A Third Testament by Malcolm Muggeridge, which is really a classic. Uh, and it's about, uh, uh, I think, uh, Dostoevsky and Bonhoeffer and uh, people who Muggeridge called God's spies, mm -hmm. taking a line from King Lear. Um, and there's, an, there's a chapter in there on William Blake, and it's one of the best things I've, I've read in William Blake. So if anyone wants to kind of find out who he is, that's a great little essay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I'll do that. Yeah. So let's get to our topic for today. So we're going to be talking about this combination of classical and Christian. And so I actually brought down uh, some books that Memoria Press uh, publishes and sells. I happen to have written a, portion, a substantial portion of this one. Oh, it must be good. Yeah, it even has it. Your, uh, your name on there. <laughs> yeah. So this that. is the Acts of the Apostles. And the reason I chose this it's not just because I wrote a portion of it along with Dave Charlton, is that the Acts of the Apostles, if you've ever studied it, has a lot of really interesting connections to the classical world. So I believe it's chapter 14, where Ovid's Metamorphosis is kind of alluded to, where you have the uh, that parable where um, they confuse Paul and Barnabas with Zeus, and, mm. and they come down and they try to worship them. Um, there's other things like um, throughout <coughs> it um, in... If you remember when Paul um, first is on the road to Damascus, in the King James Version, he says this phrase, um, God says this phrase to Paul, why do you kick against the pricks? Mm -hmm. And that is, is in the Greek text, it's probably not there. It's actually probably in the third telling later in, in, at the end of Book of Acts, but a lot of versions put it back in, in chapter nine. But it's in all three sections where he says, why do you kick against the pricks? And that's a classical expression that also appears in Oedipus Rex and places like that. So my literature professor in college said, oh, here, here's Jesus quoting classical, the <laughs> Greek tragedies, which may be the case, or maybe it's just a common expression. Um, but there's just so many different places where it seems like Luke, the author of Acts, is cognizant of this whole classical mythical tradition as he's telling the story of Jesus' life. And I've always found that really. Well, that's the cult. This, they're living in a Hellenic culture. Right. That's, of course you do that. It, we have That's expressions right. all the time that we use in English that we don't even know come from the King James Bible or from Shakespeare or whatever. It's just part of the culture. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm sure they were, you know, something like Paul was smart enough to be cognizant of that. Um, and so he may not be directly quoting certain people, although he does allude, I think, several times to uh, Roman and Greek Another poets. really good one is when um, Paul is in Athens, if you remember, where he makes, he appeals to the statue of the unknown God. Mm -hmm. In our English translation, it doesn't always come across that that is probably a trial where they're putting Paul on trial for preaching Jesus. Um, and the language they use there is really, really similar to the, the language used um, at Socrates' trial in Plato when he's telling the, the tale of Socrates' trial. It seems like there's maybe some illusion there that this is another person trying to subvert 
the Greek city state with his radical message of peace and love. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot of great stuff in Acts. I'd recommend it. Now, well, and I, I think, um, you know, sometimes we want to go in and we want to find, uh, you know, a particular like quote from a, from a poem and all that, but you don't have to do that. Just go read Paul's letters. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's stuff in there that is like textbook examples of certain logical and rhetorical uh, 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 structures that he's using. He's clearly soaked and steeped in the education of the Hellenic world. Right. Uh, so just just his whole way of speaking is a, is evidence of the fact that he's operating in, uh, using classical forms and classical models. There's a whole kind of cottage industry in New Testament scholarship, and there's a lot of those that studies the New Testament according to um, you know rhetorical technique, and they're trying to look for those kinds of techniques explained by Quintilian and others. Mm -hmm and see how in the New Testament those are mm -hmm. used. And so in our conversation, what I'm interested in, in asking you guys about is that normally when we end up talking about the, the pagans and classical literature in our context, we're kind of defending the importance of them because we'll get the question pretty frequently, why do we spend so much time t studying the classics when we're Christian? But I, I think that we can go beyond just defending ourselves and we can actually show all the different ways that knowing the classics is extremely helpful and fruitful for the kind of education that we're suggesting. Like if you know a little bit about the classics, reading the book of Acts becomes a lot more fruitful. So John, I want to start with you. What are various ways that knowing classical mythology and the classics is fruitful for education and something that's absolutely essential? Right. Um, for the sake of kind of unfettered negativity, um, there we can we can say why learning the classics is good for our Christian education. We can also why, say why not learning it is bad, right? That there is a there is a loss uh, doing it. It's not simply a matter of oh, it's acceptable, right? Oh, it's okay to read Greek mythology or Greek philosophy, but that not doing so is at a detriment to your to your learning. Um, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm teaching a class on the Divine Comedy right now, and a lot of the time I'm reminding our students who come from a you know big background or different background of Catholic, Protestant, and otherwise, um, kind of reminding them in the midst of this very distinctly Catholic but also very classically rooted author, Dante, saying, okay, keep in mind you know the background, keep in mind that this allegory, and with all that said, try not to treat as sacred what is not sacred, right? It's a pretty good rule. But also, don't treat as profane what isn't profane, right? That there's a moral a moral difficulty or a moral risk that you're making as much as treating something as unacceptable if it's actually not just acceptable, but is giving you a moral lesson, right? Like we in, in the Inferno, for example, I, I tried getting my students to while, you know, to look at a sin, look at one of the sins that are being punished in the various circles and saying, okay, we all agree that theft is evil, right? But let's actually break apart what what moral wrong are you committing when you commit that physical act, right? Taking a bag of money off of a shelf is not evil in and of itself, right? So what's going on in here that makes it evil? Let's find out what actually is profane about that action. And by doing so, not only do you kind of get to a a, a moral conclusion that might instruct you in a greater way about what actions technically constitute theft, even if it doesn't look like it, right? But also a lot of the metaphors in like particular Canto 24 where they talk about theft, sorry, Canto 20, uh, where they talk about theft, suddenly these things that seem to have nothing to do with theft, they're talking about a shepherd being afraid because his sheep can't eat. Suddenly when you think about theft, not as taking another person's goods, but specifically as treating your good as greater than that of others and treating your immortal good as lesser than your temporal good, Suddenly, the idea of, oh, it's winter, so my sheep can't eat, but they will in the spring. Suddenly, that makes perfect sense, right? So, by, by mistaking something that is questionable or possibly seems to lead to vice as something that definitely leads to vice or is actually sinful itself, ends up not just forsaking an opportunity of moral lesson, but actually might draw you to the wrong conclusions about what constitutes sin. It's like... To use a sports metaphor, <laughs> time to cover your ears. It's like when a foul gets called on a person shooting a three-point basket, and then they challenge that call, and they ask the officials to review whether it was actually a foul or not. And that person 
if it co- the call gets overturned, then the three points they should have had because they were fouled on the shot gets wiped away and the ball gets given to the other team. So we call it a three-point swing. And it's in a similar way. Are you following this, guys? No. <laughs> I just want to say, in my day, when I watched basketball, we didn't have those kind of rules. All right. Sorry. Because it was still yeah. legal to dunk at that point. Yeah, you could spend the time watching the game and not waiting for the referee to make a decision. To, to make it even more simple. <laughs> John, it seems like what you're saying is that it's not just um, a question of preference necessarily over whether these things are good or bad. It's, it's a question of what is the best way to gain the kind of virtue that we're all in pursuit of. And these are the best tools for gaining that virtue. And you might not just be remaining neutral if you don't engage in this. You actually might be losing some. Right. And there's a sort of, there's a there's a well-meaning kind of chosen ignorance that is very easy to fall into and, 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 uh, you know, very reasonably easy to fall into when you're trying to decide what your kids are going to experience. I have a two-year-old and I am desperately worried about the kind of stuff that's going to be around when, when he hits his teens, right? At the same time, though, if I end up creating a false idea of what is unacceptable, right? If I'm shielding him from something, not because it's bad, but because it may lead to something that's bad, right? Then, I end up actually putting categories in his head that might be problematic. Um, G.K. Chesterton wrote a wrote a, uh, an essay called uh, "On American Morals," uh, and of course, Chesterton was a British uh, a British author, very fond of his cig- uh, cigars and ales and things like that. And he's writing about the prohibition, right? And he's talking about talking with his kind of American academic colleagues and how, for them, you know, they they look at not drinking and not smoking as a virtue and drinking and smoking as a vice in kind of these very stark Christian senses, just like thou shalt not kill, right? And he basically writes, if those are what you count as vices, then what vices are you forgetting, right? Like if if you're not capable of making a measured relation between what is a vice and what is vicious, right? What is evil and what is simply disposed to evil and like different degrees thereof, then you're not actually creating good moral categories. And it, again, creates the opportunity or the possibility, if not the inclination, to treat as sacred what is not sacred and to treat as profane as what is not profane, right? Uh, Much clearer than the basketball analogy. (laughs) I still don't have any idea of what. Sorry, we could move on. I didn't, I didn't express it very clearly. Now, before we started this, though, Tanya, you said it, it is still important, though, to just make that basic point that the that the the pagan myths are not necessarily damaging to to our children. We've never really seen that as we teach Delaris Greek myths. They they know the difference. They do know the difference because we've made it clear. Yeah, yeah. We've made the difference clear. Just like um, we were talking about Narnia, they they know that Narnia doesn't exist. You know, that they're not going to suddenly go through a wardrobe, a magic wardrobe. Children know, and we treat faith seriously mm-hmm. in our homes and in our church experiences with our children. So that's really, I, that isn't really anything that we should even have to argue. But, and maybe I just simplify things, but I I feel like, this, you know, not studying the pagans is, I think we're we're just forgetting that they were God created mm. and that just because things happened before Christ doesn't mean that God wasn't working in the world or that the, the, the great thoughts that were put down and, and the, the great lessons in life that that they had didn't come from God, weren't divine, li- divinely inspired. And so I think we just, my kids had, a, one of my children had a teacher once who, who said, well, we're not going to study Socrates because Socrates is in hell hmm. because he was pre-Christ. And so, you know, I, I had to, it wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I had to deal with that then at home, just that Socrates wasn't evil. It wasn't his, I mean, he didn't have any control over being before Christ. <laughs> or I, It just seems like we complicate it when it seems so simple to me. 
He's evil and maybe in the sense that all humans are are have a capability to fall and are affected by original sin. But well, he sure, necessarily- but this was uh, this was based solely on the fact that he was born before Christ. But you know, Christian theologians have always talked about this term, or not always, but some of them use this term, common grace. And <laughs> God's common grace is evident before Christ, after Christ, mm, right? And the, the the rain has always fallen and given fruit to the ground, and that's that's good. We can glean from God's common grace, even from those who never knew Christ Himself. But do you think I'm simplifying it too I much? Don't. I mean, it seems so clear to me, I, and I don't understand why people have such a problem with it. I don't, and I can give you a good example, regardless of whether you take a <clears throat> excuse me a theological stance on you know the the salvific state of a pre-Christian figure, right? Um, in Aeschylus, right? Uh, in the or- Oristia, the three plays by Aeschylus about Agamemnon and so forth. I every time I teach that class, um, I point out to my students that a very specific moral conclusion is inevitable from those three plays. Um, I have probably said this on a podcast before, so I'm going to give the the quick version of it. Essentially, Orestes is put in a situation where an endless cycle of human violence reels him into it, and he has to abide by it by no cause of his own. He's in an unjust situation and he is penalized with death because of circumstances that were outside of his control. And how does the story end? Not with his essential damnation by Greek pagan standards, but with the goddess Athena coming in and basically wiping the slate clean because basically she says a situation has been created where there is no good outcome. And the only way to stop the endless cycle of violence and death is for a divine to come and wipe the slate clean. Sound familiar, right? We're not saying that Aeschylus in the year, you know, 430 BC, it's more like 470, um, in the year 470 BC was actually like a proto-Christian or something like that, but that Greek pagans, pagan as they were, were still wrestling with essentially human questions about what constitutes justice, what constitutes the, the righteous and the unrighteous man, and that they could and did come to conclusions like Aeschylus did, where you essentially have a Christian conclusion, an essentially Christian conclusion, that divine redemption is the only way out of our situation without actual revelation, right? Now, you can take this one of two ways. I take it the way of it's therefore not surprising at all that eventually when Christ showed up, the Greco-Roman world was lit on fire by this stuff, right? It took some time, of course. The but book of Acts says it was literally turned upside down. There you go. Yeah. And so, you know, when they're already asking these moral questions and coming in this hypothetical narrative, like theatrical way to these moral conclusions, and then someone offers a like actual testamental version of that conclusion, then of course, you can really see how the not just, you know, like pagan mythology, but pagan thought was yearning, was begging for something like this. And so it becomes the prologue in its own weird way to Christianity. Yeah. And, and, and when, when you say that uh, we have to basically dump everything that's pagan or pagan influenced, we walk right into the atheistic argument hmm. that Chesterton was faced with and, and wrote about, that it, it's, it's their argument that, Christianity is just another myth, because if you go back and you look, there's all these examples of this kind of thing, of the same beliefs that Christianity later articulates, yes. and all these, uh, you know, there's resurrections, there's virgin births, there's yeah, the, times the in the wilderness, and God, there's right? dying and rising, it's all there, so this gives the atheist the justification to say, well, Christianity is just another myth, and Chesterton responds to this, it says, if Christianity were true, isn't that exactly what you would expect to see? Wouldn't you be seeing premonitions of it if this was the reality all throughout history? Truth is of, predictable. Right, yeah. yeah. Of of course there's all those resurrections of virgin birth because this was the ultimate thing that was going to happen. And so I think if you take this line uh, that that the pagan stuff is false, you're, you're walking right into that argument. You have no defense for that argument. It's just another myth. So you have to be very careful with that. And in terms of the myths and all this, I mean, these are Greek tall tales. Anyway, now we don't have any problem with American tall tales. You know, it's not sinful to read Pecos Bill uh, <laughs> and you know, uh, these kinds of things. They're they're, proje- they're they're human beings. They're made in the image of God, and they're writing about being human in that way. 
And so they end up being cautionary tales or salutary tales about human beings. Um, and they're, they're true. Nobody, you can't go and you can't deny the, the messages that are being given in, in the Greek myths. Now there's some, we've cleaned them up a little bit because Ovid's versions are pretty <laughs> racy, but, but the way that they've come down to us in the West under Christian influence, under Christian education for 2000 years, they, we've had, we have a form of them that, that is morally uplifting or morally cautionary in some way. So you're, you're again defending why they're not bad. They're not bad. Mm -hmm. But why are they good? Like, I just said why they're good, because they tell us truth. <laughs> and so are they good in a way that's distinct versus any other thing that, that tells us truth? Well, you, you can start employing criteria like that, but when you do, you're going to have to reject a lot of fiction, maybe all fiction, because fiction is not true, okay, in the, the very literal sense. But it's telling you truths. And there's all kinds of, of writing, even in the modern period, from people who are not Christians who we would say, no, this is a good message. This is a good book. So the this question I'm, I'm asking you is why classical literature and not those modern stories that also tell true, true tales? Why because a lot of them are better. <laughs> because, because the ones that are being written now are based on those, <laughs> those older ones. An addition is that the, there is a, and I'm sure we've, I'm sure many teachers, both here and listening, have made a mistake like this before, where it's very difficult to morally speculate in Christian literature. It's very difficult to do that safely, right? If I went to a classroom full of high schoolers and say, what if Jesus was blank, right? In some way, that was absolutely not the case, right? That would get some letters from parents, right? It's very difficult to talk about logically talk about matters of faith or matters of of morals or ethics or whatever using actual christian real things right as your sort of building blocks for it because we already have these kind of essentially pre-coded answers on how we're supposed to deal with those right and saying otherwise either is or risks heresy right and in the realm of the modern of course the familiar even if there's no risk of heresy, there's a risk of, you know, promoting false truths or false narratives, right? But we don't, I mean, the, the, one of the strange benefits of antiquity being antiquity is that it's remote, right? I don't believe in Zeus, and therefore it's neither heresy nor in some way misleading to take a story about Zeus or whoever and mess with the details. Again, I literally just mentioned uh, Aeschylus, right? The Oresteia narrative. Euripides, and I know I've referenced this one on a pod before because I have no new ideas, um, tells a story about Orestes and completely changes the details of the story, which I won't repeat. Um, but, you know, that wasn't considered heresy per se. You know, Euripides wasn't burned at the stake. And, you know, we aren't burned at the stake either for doing so, right? Having this sort of set of stock characters with reliable symbolic associations and using them as action figures on our little diorama of putting together this human crisis or this narrative crisis and allowing it to logically resolve in a way that teaches us something moral is so much more, e so much easily, so much easily, so much more easily and so much more effectively uh, done than with any other set of fictional characters or non-fictional characters. On our website, we have an article that Mrs. Lowe wrote about reasons why you should study the classics. And one of them is this exact same point. And it's why I believe we have On the Nature of the Gods by Cicero in our senior mm -hmm. year class, because she said he in that book, he's addressing, I believe, the critiques of Epicurus against the existence of God. And he asks questions like the classic problem of evil and things like that. And Cicero is addressing them all logically. And so for a Christian to come across these extremely logical answers for why God exists and why you ought to believe in him is extremely helpful. And it's in a laboratory that's, mm -hmm. that's a little safe and a little bit cleaner and, and helpful for our students to engage with. I think, you know, also, I, I think a lot of uh, people think Christians thinking about education day really understand that historically Christian education has always been classical. Right. Um, if you go back and you look, I mean, it, it, this was always part and parcel of what a Christian education was after Augustine. And, and so, you know, and then, you know, I mean, if, if there's anybody who's going to, to, to make a, an argument against this, who would it be? It'd be the Puritans. The Puritans are the ones who came here and founded 
the great classical institutions that used to exist, Harvard and Princeton and places like this. Cotton Mather was one of the great class, classical educators of his age. He just narrowly missed being appointed president of Harvard. Um, and, and so this is the case uh, down, you know, I mean, you know, you did have figures like, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Benjamin Rush and really Benjamin Franklin to a certain extent, Noah Webster, but they're very, very much a minority in this understanding of what Christian education was and that it was thoroughly classical. And that, that, that remains the case all the way up into the 1920s of the, of, of the modern period. You kind of stole my line a little bit. Uh, I definitely wanted to talk about the, just again, it's not a like an argument from the sources itself, from classics itself, but just the historical precedent, right? That if, you know, if, if, if you're listening to this, right, there's a decent chance that you're not super happy with what's happened to education in the last 100 years, right? I mean, case in point, our school exists because people are not happy with how education has gone in the last hundred years. I think that's fair to say, right? But what can be said about education in the last hundred years? Has has classics thrived in the last hundred, or did it thrive before? Before, right? Mm -hmm. That classics and classical literature and pagan literature are definitive of a form of education that that prior to the modern age was fairly not unchanging necessarily, but stable, but constant, right? And then we have these big kind of educational revolutions in the 20s and 30s, right? And then in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, the classical paradigm of education goes up in smoke. And, well, here we are, right? Well, and this, this is the spoils of the Egyptians in, in, in many ways. The, uh, uh, Augustine makes that argument. But if you, you know, you, you look and you, you look at the invasion of Canaan, where except in one or two cases where it's explicitly prohibited, they're allowed to take their animals in, in, these, in these, these cities that they conquer. They, they take their animals, they take all their, their you know, anything they can use, and they use it, and it's not considered evil. And I think the principle is, if you conquer a culture as Christianity conquered the pagans, you get to use their stuff, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's not bad stuff, it's because pagans had it. That's the point Augustine makes, and it's kind of the point, you know, if you, if you look at the, the conquest of Canaan, that, that, that's, that's kind of a principle there. You could say it's the point Tanya made. Oh, is that the you made? Well, I started this whole thing. And Tanya, I wanted to come I, back to you because <laughs> I want you to bring us down a couple of notches. And Why are you choosing her to do that specifically? Because <laughs> <laughs> she makes the most sense. Okay. Um, Okay. <laughs> I can I can talk to the common man. Okay. What do you What do you think it is? May, and maybe the answer is obvious, but I, I'm curious from your perspective. What do you think it is that causes people to ask this particular question? How do these fit together? What What tendencies should we be addressing? What What are people afraid of? I, well, that's the that is the question. What are people afraid of? And they are afraid, and that's why. I think they're afraid of what their children are exposed to. And if we expose them to mythology, then will they really know what truth is? And all of those are just unnecessary worries. But it is, I mean, there's definitely a fear of the pagans out there. And um, obviously that's what we're doing is trying to fight against that and say these these guys are worthy of being read. And the illusions from them are, you know, I've said how many times now <clears throat> that I'm not a fan of fantasy, but I mean, really, do you want your children to go through life without Tolkien or without Greek mythology? How much will they be missing so much? And it is not a threat at all to their Christian faith. And I don't know, but it continue. It does. Con the question continues to come up, which is why we keep talking about it. And I think when we're talking about the pagans, you know, there are a lot of different kinds of pagans. Right. I mean, there yes. were the, the Greeks are a different kind of pagan, really. I mean, it, you know, you, from, you look at these from say the Egyptians, from the Babylonians, from the Assyrians, who who did not really get what a human being was. I mean, it, and, and you can see it in their in their in their religious statuary and their religious art where they're mixing together men and animals and the Egyptians have a, you know, uh, a body of a man in the head of an eagle and a, and, and, and a body of a lion in the head of a man. They, it's, it's all mixed in together. And then you get to the Greeks. 
And all of a sudden, you have this, this focus on the human being. I mean, there's two transitions you have to make here culturally uh, between um, the, the, the animal and man and the man and God. This is Chesterton's whole thesis in The Everlasting Man. Okay, and I think we need to recognize that the Greeks got this half right. They, they understood the difference between the human being and the animal. They understood it very well. That, that's the first step. They got that right. The next step, they, they, they didn't quite get right, although they were moving in that direction. There, there was a movement among Greek thinkers towards monotheism. You can really see it in Socrates, who, who's always referring to God. Mm-hmm. Not always, but, but he refers to God. He doesn't say the gods. I mean, sometimes he says that in other contexts. But he refers to God as if there's just one. Um, and so I think we need to, to when, we talk, when we're talking about pagans, we're talking about the Greeks mostly and the, the Romans who follow from the Greeks where they have this, they have a lot of it right. And because they understand what a human being is, they're, in, they're headed in the right direction. And uh, doesn't all this sound beautiful? And so what, don't you want your children to have the benefit of that, of that all of those good things that they did and that they figured out? Yeah. And back to Martin, to your point, I, I, I'm not a scholar in this particular question. So, you know, I'm sure it exists that there was cultural exchange between the Greeks and, you know, the Babylonian and Assyrian Empire and things mm-hmm. like that. But what, you, what I don't know of is someone like Philo, who is this Jewish man who is also a Greek philosopher. And he was trying to, to put, you know, the law of Moses and Plato together. And this is, you know, something that happened. And you have a Greek tragedy written by, uh, about the life of Moses. But do, we don't, I don't know of any Greek tragedies about Gilgamesh. And so what mm. was it about that pre-Christian Jewish tradition that so resonated with the Greek culture? Well, the, the Greek culture, uh, the Greeks, as Werner Jaeger points this, this out in his Paideia series, is is that the Greeks were the, the the Jews were thoroughly Hellenized, right? Right. Uh, they're 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 reading from a Greek Bible. Most of the quotations in the New Testament are from the Greek Septuagint. They're speaking Greek. They're thinking Greek now. They're participating in these centers of learning, like Alexandria, um, and so they had already a lot of this had already been done, which is why I think you get some uh, articulation like in in at the very beginning of John, where he identifies Christ as the Logos. Right. That is a term pregnant with all kinds of Greek meaning. Uh, the New Testament is written in Greek. You, you, you can't get away. I, I, to, to me, that's providence, clearly. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not a mistake. Right. <laughs> Uh, and we recognize that because we think if we go back to the original autographs that we've got a, a, an, an, an inerrant text there. Right. Uh, that inerrant text is in Greek. Okay, and you can't get away from Greek thinking when you're using the Greek language. John, last thoughts on the combination of classical and Christian? Last thoughts. Simply that, again, the relationship between the two is sequential, right? The, that you can think of the role that, the, that classical literature, classical mythology, even the very distinctly pagan parts of it, as, again, the strivings of a very intellectually gifted people towards the truth. And they gained many truths. They, you know, did not succeed in many truths. But so many of the things that they were striving for were eventually fulfilled in Christianity, right? And so any Western person taking part in that, and by that I mean Christianity, by that I mean Western literature, whether we're talking about Shakespeare or Hemingway or whoever, right? necessarily is partaking in that whether they know it or not, right? There's a sort of debt that we owe to thinkers, even non-Christian thinkers, for what we have, where there's a sort of, I suppose, ingratitude, possibly an unknowing ingratitude that we that we kind of espouse if we choose to cut it off at the cut it off at the knees and say that the only things worth reading are the ones that are, you know, Christian kind of in 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 absentia of anything else, right? Because describing Christian in absentia of anything else is there's no such thing, right? right, right. E- even in the sense of like you know it, it itself was built on Old Testament Judaism, right? Um, and that so many of the people that you know are so many of the things that concerns that people have about 
about the paganism or the magic or the innuendos of classical literature do so out of, again, mistaking as sin what could be, maybe, possibly risks a, a viciousness, a, a tendency towards vice. But again, to mistake vice as sin itself to, or to mistake the appearance of vice as sin itself or the relation, the narrative description of vice as sin itself is to render a whole category of, you know, human thought and human instruction unavailable. Do you think you'll talk about any of this at our summer conference this summer where you're going to be spending <laughs> two days summarizing the content of our classical studies? I think program? it's one day. I think it's one day. Yeah. On our schedule, For it's one, one day. day. Of, <laughs> of, <laughs> I'll just keep talking if people still listen, but uh, one day officially. Um, something tells me it'll come up. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Well, it's been a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Classical Etc. If you'd like to show your support for the show, then you can leave a like below. If you'd like to add your voice to the conversation, then you can comment. And if you want to follow along with us on this journey, then please subscribe. Thanks, and I'll see you later.